Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element gadolinium. I have a sample of that element right here in this vial right here. Now, that sample might be a little hard for you to see, so let's go back to our slideshow because I've put it on the scanner for you. It's a shiny silvery metal when kept inside the vial and away from the air. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Gadolinium is the 64th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 64 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. Gadolinium was discovered in 1880 by Jean-Charles de Marniac, who detected its oxide by using spectroscopy. It's named after the mineral gadolinite, one of the minerals in which gadolinium is found. Gadolinite, sometimes known as yitterbite, is a silicate mineral consisting principally of the silicates of cerium, lanthanum, neodymium, yttrium, beryllium, and iron, and, obviously, some minor amount of gadolinium. It's not a commercial source of gadolinium, however. Gadolinite was named for the famous Finnish chemist Johann Gadolin. Gadolin was responsible for discovering the oxide of the first rare earth, yttrium, in 1794. He was awarded the Order of St. Vladimir and the Order of St. Anna, and yes, a postage stamp on the bicentennial of his birthday in 1960. Chemist Paul Emile Lecoq was the first person to isolate pure gadolinium metal around 1886. One commercial source of rare earth elements is the mineral monazite. Monazite is a phosphate with lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, and neodymium as major substituting elements, and most of the other rare earths as minor constituents. It's usually found in the form of a sand with other minerals. India, Madagascar, and South Africa have large deposits of monazite sands. Another source of rare earths, including gadolinium, is the mineral basnesite, which is a carbonate fluoride with lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, or yttrium as major substituting elements. Both monocyte and basnesite are mined for many rare earths. Another rare earth containing mineral has the coolest name, xenotime. This is normally a yttrium orthophosphate, but other elements can take the place of yttrium, including gadolinium. Let's take a look at the rare earth content of the previous three minerals. You can see from this table, gadolinium appears in low percentages in these minerals, accounting for only 0.3 to 0.4% of basnesite, 1.5 to 6.56% of monocyte, and up to 4% of xenotime. One last gadolinium-containing mineral is the beautiful lepersonite, found in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It has a very complicated chemical formula that I'm not even going to try to put into words. Note, however, that this mineral contains not only gadolinium, but also uranium. This mineral was one source of uranium used in the Manhattan Project to build the first atomic bomb. The only rare earth mining and processing facility in the United States is the Mountain Pass Mine, 53 miles southwest of Las Vegas. The mine supplies almost 15% of the world's rare earth production. While this mine specializes in praseodymium and neodymium, they also extract other rare earths including gadolinium, as byproducts. 
Gadolinium belongs to a row of elements known as the rare earth metals, or lanthanides, since lanthanum is the first element in this periodic table row. Gadolinium is the eighth element of this series. Technically, both scandium and yttrium are also included in this group since they're both members of the same periodic table column. Both the lanthanide row and the actinide row below it actually fit in the two spaces after barium and radium. But if we display the table in this fashion, it becomes too long and unwieldy to fit in books or on posters. As with most elements, the price of gadolinium varies widely with purity and the quantity that you buy. 99% pure gadolinium goes for about $31 per kilogram in large quantities, fairly cheap given its apparent rarity. The element gadolinium is fairly uncommon in the universe, coming in as the 55th most abundant element in the universe by mass at 200 parts per billion. At 53rd, europium is extremely rare in the sun too, also 200 parts per billion. It's 53rd most abundant element in meteorites, about 23 parts per million. Surprisingly common compared to everywhere else, in the crust of the earth, it's the 42nd most common element, almost 520 parts per million, even more common than tin. Gadolinium is the 66th most abundant element in the oceans, virtually non-existent at 70 parts per trillion. And lastly, and not surprisingly, there is no gadolinium in us. This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Gadolinium is here. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at just gadolinium a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang to now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of gadolinium created by various processes. The majority of gadolinium present today is believed to be produced in supernovae, the yellow area. About one quarter is produced in dying low mass stars, the magenta area. And a small amount, that green sliver on the top, is produced in neutron star mergers. Note the gadolinium produced by dying low mass stars, the magenta area, doesn't get started until a bit later in the history of the universe. That's because low mass stars exhaust their nuclear fuel much more slowly and last a long time before they start dying. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same. 64 protons for gadolinium. But there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 36 known isotopes of gadolinium. Of these 36, there are six stable, non-radioactive isotopes. These isotopes occur in nature in varying amounts, as you see here. This is just shy of 100%, by only 0.2%, which is filled by a very long-lived radioactive isotope, gadolinium-152. More on that in the next slide. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek, isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of gadolinium occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of gadolinium, these nine are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. More about half-lives in the next slide. The longest lived isotope is gadolinium-152 with a half-life of 1.08 times 10 to the 14th years. That's 108 trillion years, almost 8,000 times the age of the universe. 
You see that extremely little of this isotope has had enough time to decay significantly, which is why it's still 0.2% of natural gadolinium. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slide. You'll see why I chose 1,024 atoms. Hint, it's a power of 2, and we're going to be doing a lot of divisions by 2. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, Notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives here. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Gadolinium has a medium density at 7.9 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter. I've put up more densities for you here. You can see that Gadolinium is almost exactly the same as iron. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself. But we'll have to wait to do this until we're back face to face. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, and finally magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, gadolinium's density is 7.9 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle just a touch above iron. Gadolinium has a fairly low melting point at 1,585 degrees Celsius, or 2,394 degrees Fahrenheit. It boils at 3,000 degrees Celsius, or 5,432 degrees Fahrenheit, 1,688 degrees centigrade above its melting point. Quite a large difference. If we compare the size of the gadolinium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The gadolinium atom is almost 4.4 times the size of hydrogen. Those two outer electrons are held fairly loosely. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are small. Here are atom sizes sorted from the largest, cesium, on the left, to the smallest, Helium on the right. Gadolinium has the seventh largest atom of all the elements. All the rare earth elements are fairly large. I'll mark the other lanthanides in blue. Notice how they're all clustered towards the top of the chart. They all have those loosely held outer two electrons. Gadolinium is a moderately hard element coming in at 5.13 on Mohs scale of hardness, about the same hardness as your teeth. Gadolinium does not expand much when you heat it. It has the 43rd highest rate of thermal expansion, about 9.4 parts per million per degree Celsius. This means if you had a one meter long bar of gadolinium, and we're going to have to magnify this by a factor of 10 just to see it. And you heated it by 1 degree Celsius, it would get longer by only 9.4 millionths of a meter, less than a hair width. Gadolinium expands only 3.6 times as much as the least expansive element, silicon. Gadolinium is one of the few elements that's strongly attracted to a magnet at room temperature. Let me show you. I have here my sample of gadolinium that I started with earlier today. I have a very strong magnet. Let's see if it's attracted. 
Oh, there we go. Very strong attraction. Now, many elements are attracted to a magnet, albeit weakly. The atoms align with the field and the element itself becomes magnetic. When the magnet is removed, they lose those magnetic properties. Uh, these are called paramagnetic. A few elements, when attracted to a magnet, are themselves magnetized and retain the magnetic field even after the original magnet is removed. They become magnets. These are called ferromagnetic. The ferromagnetic elements are iron, cobalt, nickel, and gadolinium. These properties are temperature dependent, and if the temperature is too high, even these elements lose their ability to be magnetized. This temperature is called the Curie point, and for gadolinium, this occurs at room temperature, 19 degrees Celsius or 66 degrees Fahrenheit. Below room temperature, it holds its magnetic field. Above room temperature, it loses its magnetic field. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. Gadolinium has a weak set of emission lines, except for some stronger greens. Let's take a look at a few applications of this rare earth element. Some are a bit esoteric, but I'll do my best. Gadolinium gallium garnet is an artificially produced material that can be a diamond simulant. It's much softer than diamond, however, about the same as quartz, but it shares some of the optical qualities of its carbon cousin. Normally clear when pure, small impurities of other elements, called dopants, can give them various colors. There are other high-tech uses for this material. Adding gadolinium in small amounts, as little as 1%, can improve the workability and resistance to high temperatures and oxidation of iron, chromium, and other alloys. You may have noticed that x-rays, like everything else in the world, has gone digital. You no longer have to wait for the film to get developed. This was actually first used commercially in 1983. For a chest x-ray, for instance, you stand in front of a panel like this one, and moments later, you can see the results on a screen. Gadolinium is a part of a light-emitting phosphor inside the panel that makes this work. Let's see how. We start with a base plate on which we mount a two-dimensional array of photo detectors. On top of these, we place a plate of material that gives off light when hit with x-rays. This is called a scintillator. This scintillator is, and stay with me here, terbium-doped gadolinium oxysulfide. The gadolinium helps absorb the x-rays, and the terbium, the next element in our series, creates a green glow picked up by the photosensors below. It's pretty efficient stuff, converting up to 20% of the incoming x-rays into light. More efficiency means a smaller dose of x-rays. The photosensors are connected to a computer that reads out the data and constructs a picture. Let's see it in action and review the steps. X-rays, after moving through you, hit the scintillator, causing it to glow. This is seen by the photosensor array below. A computer then reads out which sensors detected x-rays. The computer constructs a picture, which is then analyzed by your radiologist. We already looked at one magnetic property of gadolinium. If you thought that magnets and heat had nothing to do with each other, you're going to love this one. There's actually something called the magnetocaloric effect. Let's say you start with a brick of gadolinium or gadolinium alloy. Now we need a strong electromagnet. We take our brick and place it between the pole pieces. When we switch on the magnetic field, the domains in the brick align with the field of the magnet. The net effect of this heats the brick up. The hot brick radiates away the heat into the environment and cools back down to room temperature. The magnetic domains are still aligned with the magnetic field. 
Now, if we shut off the magnet and remove the block, the domains in the brick will once again randomize. But this makes the brick cooler. The process can be repeated over and over again to achieve lower and lower temperatures. This effect was first observed in 1881 by German physicist Emil Gabriel Warburg. Gadolinium displays the magnetocaloric effect, but whether this will provide us with future exotic refrigerators remains to be seen. If you're building a nuclear reactor, you want tight control of your fission process going on inside the reactor core. Fission of the uranium atom happens when it's hit with a stray neutron. The extra neutron destabilizes the nucleus, which then splits into two smaller, lighter nuclei, and also releases a few additional neutrons. The additional neutrons are now free to cause more uranium to fission. Since many neutrons are released by a single fissioning uranium atom, and each neutron can cause a further uranium atom to fission, the reaction can grow exponentially. Now, you might want an uncontrolled exponential release of energy if you were, for instance, developing a nuclear weapon. However, to control the fission reaction, you need to absorb a critical number of neutrons. Some elements, like cadmium and gadolinium, are very good neutron absorbers. In a nuclear reactor core, control rods of these absorbing elements are interspersed among the uranium fuel rods. Pulling the rods out of the core allows more neutron reactions to take place, heating up the core. Pushing the rods in slows the reaction, cooling the reactor. Control rods are important, but gadolinium plays another important role in nuclear reactors. When new uranium fuel is loaded into a reactor, it's highly radioactive. As it fissions, the radioactivity drops off exponentially. We'd like the reaction to be slower with the new fuel and faster with the old fuel. This can be managed using the control rods I just mentioned, but there's another way that does not rely on mechanically inserting and removing control rods, and it involves gadolinium. This one's a bit complicated to explain, but the isotope gadolinium-157 has the highest probability of any element of capturing slow neutrons like the ones we find in the reactor. This prevents those neutrons from participating in the fission process. Most of the rare earth elements fall near the top of this chart, but gadolinium-157 is better than all of them. Why is that important? To control large amounts of excess fuel without control rods, nuclear burnable poisons are mixed into the fissile uranium fuel in the core. Burnable poisons are materials that easily absorb neutrons, like gadolinium-157. When they absorb neutrons, they're converted into different isotopes that absorb neutrons far less efficiently. In our case, we start with gadolinium-157. When the gadolinium-157 atom absorbs a neutron, it becomes gadolinium-158. That absorbed neutron can no longer participate in the fission process. Gadolinium-158 is a much poorer absorber of neutrons. As a matter of fact, gadolinium-157 absorbs neutrons over 125,000 times better than gadolinium-158. As the uranium fissions, more and more gadolinium-157 is converted to gadolinium-158. As the amount of uranium decreases, so too does the amount of poisoning gadolinium-157. The net effect is an evening out of the activity in the reactor core. The activity of the initial hot load of fuel is tamped down due to the poisoning effect of the initial gadolinium-157, but as it's converted to gadolinium-158, the remaining uranium is allowed to react more strongly though there is now less of it. This evens out the energy of the reactor without the use of control rods. 
The magnetic properties of gadolinium make it an important part of improving MRI scans. A gadolinium compound, in this case Magnavist, is infused into the patient via IV. The gadolinium enhances the contrast of the resulting scan, allowing the radiologist to see more detail. Another brand of this contrast agent is OmniScan, and looking at its chemical structure, you can see gadolinium's central role. Gadolinium is toxic by itself, but when bound up in this molecule, it poses little risk to the patient. Here are contrast-enhanced MRI scans of my head, just before these were made, I was given a dose of contrast-enhancing gadolinium. Now you can see what's going on inside my head. Don't concern yourself, all was normal. The MRI machine is a wonder of modern technology. Here, you see an MRI machine with the covers removed during servicing. I don't want to scare you, but what you don't know when you're in the machine is what's happening behind the covers. Take a look. Not only is this massive machine spinning around you at high speeds, hence the loud noises you hear, but the magnets themselves inside this machine are cooled with liquid helium, just above absolute zero. The machine weighs as much as a motorhome. You may not move quickly through the machine, but it's actually a real thrill ride. I can tell the magnet in this video was not energized because that wrench you see on the patient's bed would have been sucked into the machine by the huge magnetic field, which is 80,000 times as powerful as the Earth's magnetic field. Your body does not use gadolinium, but probably still contains a few micrograms absorbed from the environment. There is some hope that gadolinium may someday provide a more targeted way to treat cancer tumors. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about gadolinium. Within reactors, your appetite for neutrons can be bothersome. In the next program in this series, we'll examine the next lanthanide element, terbium. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about gadolinium.